Well, well no. welcome everyone to uh, the Feminism and Legal Theory Project and Vulnerability and Human Condition Initiative's um, ongoing series of, of speakers. And we're really delighted to have Angela Campbell here today uh, to talk about her work. And she's actually um, working on a book that has to do with uh, the laws, conceptions, and responses to women's choices made um, uh, in connection with socially and morally controversial lifestyles. And she uses polygamy, paid surrogacy, and prostitution as case studies uh, in this book. And actually, I'm delighted to say that um, this book is going to be included in a series that I edit for Ashgate on uh, gender in law, uh, gender in law, culture, and society, the, uh, that series. Uh, it's going to be on so happy about that. Um, and today she's going to talk to us uh, about prostitution. Um, Angela is at McGill uh, University in Canada in the Faculty of Law there. And uh, I know we're all very eager to, to hear her. So she'll speak and then you'll take some questions. Yeah. So I've planned to talk about 25, 30 minutes and then leave about the same for questions. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you for hosting me this week here at, the, at Emory Law School in the context of the FL, FLT. Uh, VHC, lots of ac acronyms, but I think I have them all down. Um, these initiatives and projects are important and the themes are quite close to the core of, of the themes that I'm going to be addressing in this book project, uh, which Martha discussed. I'd also like to thank Emily and Stu for making me feel so welcome uh, on my arrival today and, uh, and looking forward to spending the rest of, of my week here at the law school. So before I begin to discuss um, sex work or prostitution, I'd like to give a little bit of background or context uh, to the book project that I'm pursuing because what I circulated for consideration is one of the chapters, it's a draft chapter in this book, but um, I'm hoping that it, it reads and it's comprehensible as a standalone text, but I thought it would also be helpful to give some context. So um, the, the project, as Martha mentioned, aims to think about the way in which law responds to controversial lifestyles that women adopt. And I'm using three case studies, um, polygamy, paid surrogacy, and prostitution. And the idea that I had for this book originated from a period during which I did empirical research interviewing women who are in polygamous marriages in a community in Canada where polygamy is openly practiced and it's taken up as a tenet of faith. Um, it's a fundamentalist Mormon community. Even though, uh, so the practice occurs even though polygamy is criminalized in Canada as it is um, in most Western jurisdictions. So my goal was to speak to women in the community, uh, which is known as Bountiful, it's in British Columbia, and my goal was to speak with these women to find out uh, two things. First, how they made their choices about polygamous life, right? So why did they become involved in polygamy in the first place? And then how, how did they understand that, that lifestyle, what kind of um, meaning did they give to it? And second, um, my goal was to understand how they viewed the state's response to polygamy. I wanted to understand what they understood about the law and how they uh, evaluated the law. Um, and what I saw or, or heard in speaking to these women was um, a, a narrative. So there were different experiences, of course, and that's not surprising. But what I understood, first of all, was a, a deep appreciation of the law. So they understood the law correctly, but they also understood the law as more oppressive than the patriarchal norms of their religion and culture under which they were living. Um, and when I reported back through my research on what I found in this polygamous community, and when I reported back specifically on the narratives that had been shared by these women, the reaction that I got across the board, whether I was speaking to a journalist, to the court, I testified as an expert witness in a reference case um, on uh, the constitutionality of the ban on polygamy, or just to my colleagues, my students. Um, some individuals kind of believed, so to speak, but many, many, many uh, felt that there was some delusion, shall I say, on my part, or some kind of um, blind faith in the narratives without being sufficiently critical, right? So I wasn't asking um, the questions in a way that was tough enough, probative enough, to make sure that I wasn't being played by these women. And if they were telling the truth, right, about what their experiences were, then in all uh, probability, they were deluded themselves. So they were suffering from false consciousness, and I should have probably not believed just the same because there was no way a woman could have actively chosen 
a lifestyle in which her husband was shared by at least one other woman. Um, so the, the project then prompted me to think very uh, much about a couple of things. One is the value of doing empirical research um, as a legal scholar and how much weight we can attribute to empirical uh, evidence that we uh, um, acquire through on-the-ground study. And the second is to think through the way the law responds to um, lifestyle choices that women make that are ostensibly compromising of women's own uh, interests. And in, in so doing, my goal was to think through the way in which the law rejects the notion of choice that women claim that they are making with respect to these lifestyles um, and decisions. Um, and in, in undertaking that rejection of this concept of choice, law in turn capitalizes on this understanding of vulnerability and victimization to then deploy the criminal law. Right? So in all of my case studies that I'm looking at, criminal law is at play. And the criminal law gets deployed prim primarily by relying on a narrative of victimization and vulnerability. So my goal then is to think about how th these instances of state law's regulation of victim women uh, reflects a narrative, a particular narrative, about women's capacities in relation to family, sex, intimacy, and reproduction. On the other hand, having said this, I feel like there's a danger to my work. And my goal is to ensure that by shifting the focus from vulnerability to power and to resistance or resilience, and to identify these moments of agency rather than thinking only about victimization, that women's interests are not cast aside. So I'm treading carefully and thinking, um, uh, thinking about resistance and power to avoid falling into a liberal trap where women are seen as fully autonomous in this kind of mythical way that would allow for the public abdication of responsibility for palliating historical and ongoing disadvantage. So in, in the work that I've done, I've, I've looked at empirical data um, on polygamy, surrogacy, and prostitution, and I'm going to focus today on prostitution, um, but I'm happy to bring in some of the themes that are transversely cross-cutting across these three case studies. Um, I noticed two particular things that happen when criminal law is invoked to protect supposedly vulnerable women. So the first is that the rhetoric and the messaging become so powerful that empirics, so evidence about the actual lived experiences of real people, are ignored. So empirics get ignored um, either because they're, they don't matter or because there's not sufficient truth to the empirics that we can acquire. The second thing that happens is that we find that any presumed vulnerabilities that may not have existed or maybe didn't exist to the scope that we imagine, um, these vulnerabilities become real and acute. So law, therefore, has the directly inverse effect that it purports to achieve. So um, uh, let's zero in now on, on, um, on prostitution and we'll think through these themes in this particular context. So I just note a little bit about uh, the focus. As I've mentioned, I have these three case studies, and in my work, I've chosen to do a, um, a comparative analysis that looks at the legal regulation and the state's response to these practices in three jurisdictions. And these jurisdictions are Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia. And I've chosen these three jurisdictions because they, are, they afford um, sufficient evidence for what my project sets out to do. They're also comparative in the sense that they share a common legal tradition, so they're originally from the common law. Um, and they're also occur, they also um, afford case studies that occur in a developed democratic context. Um, that is not to say that, that a study of surrogacy or prostitution or polygamy in the non-developed world in a different legal tradition wouldn't be relevant. It's just that for the purposes of defining the scope of the project, these were my decisions. Um, I also want to make a preliminary note about language, and Stu and I talked this morning about the use of the word prostitute that I um, invoke throughout the, um, the chapter. So this term um, was chosen rather than what we might see as the more sensitive or appropriate term of sex worker. Um, I want to, in using this word prostitute, I'd like to ask you, the listeners, to hear this term disconnected from any pejorative connotations uh, it has or conjures, as my intention is not to have this word carry any particular political meaning or weight, um, but I use prostitution and prostitute primarily because 
Sex work is a broader term and a more recent term, and my project focuses on historical and current uh, regulation of the direct sexual contact exchange for money. And that's how prostitution is conventionally understood. I also do not include analyses of um, the empirical literature on practices like um, erotic dance or pornography. So while uh, prostitution is, is more limited in that way, we might talk about whether or not the language choice here um, may be opened up, right? If there's some in, uh, impropriety that you see, I'd be happy to hear that, uh, hear those thoughts because I did wrestle with this considerably. Um, also, my focus is on women. Uh, although some of the empirical data that I have has included um, uh, data from interviews and sampling that involve not just women but also male and trans um, uh, sex workers or prostitutes. Okay, so my discussion is going to proceed in three parts. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the narratives that are gleaned from social science empirical data on the experiences or narratives of prostitutes. Um, second, uh, I'll talk about law's engagement with prostitution. I don't know if I should stop and tell them, just do a check to make sure people in the, are in the right place or not, but anyway, they'll figure it out when we're not talking about teaching. Um, okay, and third, I'd like to talk about the way in which law and the social science narratives converge, so the intersections between law and lived experience. So turning first to women's narratives um, and the social science data to that effect, um, I saw in my research, and I've done this for all three case studies, to identify scholarship that illuminates the meaning and the value that women ascribe to controversial choices that they make, which are outlawed. Okay? So by the meaning, I mean the explanation or the reason they claim to engage with a particular practice. Why have they engaged with prostitution? What were they aspiring to accomplish? And by value, I mean the way in which women normatively assess their experiences. Do they see as positive or negative their engagement with prostitution? And this is more of a retrospective analysis, a looking back, and then a normative evaluation. So turning first to the meaning or the, reason in wh the reasons for which women engage with prostitution, three particular factors circulate through the literature. The most predominant feature is, not surprisingly, money, right? Most women become prostitutes for money. And this is not surprising if we think of this as work, right? Most people go to work for money. So income, or finding a source of income, is the primary um, reason or way in which women give meaning to their involvement with prostitution. That, however, doesn't lead to a singular conclusion or um, uh, data result with respect to the economic circumstances of the women who engage in prostitution. These vary. So for some women, there's clearly a situation of desperation and women turn to prostitution as a last resort. In other cases though, women <coughs> excuse me, identify a range of options and choose prostitution from that array of options. So there is some sort of option identification and selection going on. Besides money, two other factors come into play. One is drug dependence, so there is a correlation between substance dependency and prostitution, although that correlation is very simplistically uh, defined in the literature and it needs to be probed and explored further because there is not necessarily a cause and effect between um, addiction and prostitution. In fact, for some women, drug use intensifies and or begins after entry into prostitution. And the third factor, and this is something that I um, would like to see more work done on, is a the factor of sexual intrigue or curiosity. So there are, in some pockets of the literature, stories or narratives recounted by women who claim that they entered prostitution or became prostitutes because of a sheer curiosity or intrigue. Right? They, they would find it interesting. It was a way to explore their sexual selves or sexual identity. Um, that claim is heavily disputed by some um, sex worker organizations, some feminist organizations, who claim strongly that it was impossible to imagine a woman becoming a sex worker, quote unquote, for the fun of it. Right? And this morning, as I was looking um, in the Montreal newspapers, one of our daily papers, La Presse, had a story about a woman who is now working with um, the Montreal Police Service, 
who is who was recounting her story and um, firmly held to the view that she and other women who had been involved in prostitution shouldn't be viewed by the police as criminals but instead are victims and they need therefore protection from the police rather than uh, punitive consequences. And in describing her experiences, she said there are certain myths that need to be overcome. So this was her story as recounted through this article. And I relay it now just because it's so uh, linked to this idea of women who become um, as prostitutes for, out, of, out of curiosity or intrigue. She said that one of the key myths that needs to be overcome is that women who, um, who become involved in prostitution are simply promiscuous or um, nymphomaniacs. And that myth lends itself to under-policing the situation. So I would then say that although there are some pockets of the literature suggesting this is a possibility, it needs to be carefully scrutinized. Okay, I turn now to thinking about the value or the way in which women attribute some sense of um, uh, normativity. So do they assess as positively or negatively their experiences um, in prostitution? And here again, three key factors emerge. So they are, first, the way in which their lives as prostitutes affects health and safety. Second, the way in which um, life as a prostitute affords a, um, a dependent income, as well as flexibility and independence in their job. And third, the relationships that women form as prostitutes. So I'll take these quickly in turn. With respect to health and safety, it is very well known that the dangers of prostitution are stark. The data suggests, suggests that every day a prostitute works, her health, her mind, her body, and her life are potentially at risk. So I'll discuss in a few moments some of the ways in which women identify and negotiate very shrewdly these risks, sometimes alone and sometimes uh, in concert with others with whom they work. However, their ability to negotiate risk and the level of risk that they encounter in their work or that they see themselves as um, uh, susceptible to very much affects how positively or negatively they, they, they view their experiences. Um, income and independence has a bit of an inverse effect. So the more, uh, not necessarily the more um, money women make, but the, the more dependent um, they view their income as being. So the, the more consistency they see the income yield as being, right? The, the, the speed with which money can be acquired through prostitution, the fact that it is viewed as fast money and clean money um, is something that lends value to prostitution for some women. So does the fact that much of this work comes with quote unquote no strings attached. Women see themselves as able to manage their own uh, work schedule, the parameters of their work. So there is a certain flexibility and independence that many women describe as extremely valuable to them. And that is important because in thinking about the options many of these women have, the alternative is a very low wage, onerous job, often uh, with either heavy hours or too few hours, and very little flexibility. So prostitution, therefore, becomes highly desirable. And the women who made this claim were most often those who, were, who had dependents, um, young kids or uh, older parents to whom they were, were tending. OK, and the third factor that lends value to the practice relates to companionship and support. So for many women, uh, the idea of building um, solidarity and friendship through prostitution enhanced the value of the experience for them. And they talked about one another, the women who were, have been interviewed through empirical research, talked about one another as um, sisters in solidarity, as um, uh, friends who ensured their survival and their sanity, as having each other's backs. And so this was not just sort of working through the emotional aspects of their work, but also the very physical risks that they faced. So women would do things like when uh, one woman would get into a car, let's say, with a client, the others would always make sure to take down the license plate number. Sometimes they insisted on working together. So if one woman was servicing a client, the other would wait in the room, right, or in the next room. So there was a sense of partnering and teaming. And this idea, this language of having each other's backs emerges fr quite frequently. At the same time, there are narratives of extreme competition, often violent competition among women who, especially when it came to uh, territorial claims, right? So women who worked in particular areas, um, if a, a person 
a new woman came into the, the area, she was often viewed as a threat and a potential way to dilute the income yield of others who had already been in that area. So that's a, a, a kind of brief survey of the social science um, literature. I want to just talk to you now about the, the legal approaches, and here I'll be brief. The legal approaches um, that exist in the three jurisdictions that I've considered, and then we'll think about the way in which these legal or regulatory approaches intersect with the social science research. So um, in Canada and in the United Kingdom, prostitution itself, right, so the sale of sex itself is not criminalized. Instead, um, activities associated with the exchange of sex for money or goods, those activities, associated activities, are criminalized. So specifically, um, practices related to keeping or managing brothels in the Canadian Criminal Code, these are called body houses, inducing, procuring, or living on the gains of prostitution, the avails of prostitution, that is criminalized, as is soliciting or loitering or communicating for the purposes of prostitution. And this last offense targets, in particular, street or outdoor prostitution. Um, in Canada, the current legal framework that governs prostitution, so the criminalization specifically of uh, living off the avails of prostitution, uh, the body house provisions and the solicitation provisions have all been constitutionally challenged. And this is not the first time that the living, uh, sorry, that the solicitation offense has been criminalized. It was unsuccess unsuccessfully challenged in the past, in the early 90s, on the basis of freedom of expression. The challenges now relate to security of the person. And at trial, the claims were successful. Before the Court of Appeal for the province of Ontario, the claims were su successful with respect to the challenge of the constitutionality of the ban. So the Court of Appeal struck down the bans on procuring for prostitution and living off the avails as too broad mm -hmm. and potentially endangering, endangering the lives of the women who engage in prostitution. But the court said that the solicitation ban was constitutionally valid. Okay, there was a dissent there. Now, these, uh, this decision has been appealed and will go before the Supreme Court of Canada later this year, so we'll have to, to wait and see um, what the court decides in this regard. But um, for now, the, the status quo, there's a, a stay of, of the, court's the court's decision, but the Court of Appeal has held then that the constitutionality remains with respect to the, um, the solicitation offense, but that the procuring offense and that the living off the of uh, offense are too broad. Um, in Australia, which is a more decentralized federation, uh, prostitution is governed at the state level. So I've identified in this work three different approaches, um, each one exemplified by a different state, and I'll just explain those briefly. So the three states that I've chosen are Tasmania, New South Wales, and Queensland. And Tasmania's approach is the strictest, and it retains uh, a criminalization approach. Um, so criminalize, criminalization uh, applies to all associated activities, but all, again, not to the sale of sex itself. Um, the only activity in Tasmania that's not criminalized is uh, operating as, a, as an independent sole operator, which is very hard to do uh, without being caught by one of the other provisions because eventually some communication has to happen and you could be uh, caught under, under that provision. New South Wales is, um, has an approach of decriminalization, and it's often held out as the most progressive model of the ones that I'm considering in, in this project. Um, but the decriminalization applies only to brothels. And the brothels have been decriminalized, however, they are subject to strict administrative provision, um, restrictions, um, as have the solicitation uh, requirements. So solicitation is decriminalized only in particular zones, right? So there are some activities that uh, can then therefore go on, but the strict parameters have been placed on these through administrative law. And uh, I'm happy to pick that up in, in um, the, the Q&A at, uh, at the end. And then last, there's a regulatory model. So there's three different models, so criminalization, decriminalization, and then an in-between model, which is re regulation, where um, brothels can be recognized as legal businesses if they are licensed. So there's a licensing model. And in this, um, this chapter that I circulated, I, I want to get into the fact that regulation um, in and of itself, at first glance, looks less punitive, but in fact can impose onerous requirements 
that can be just as devastating for the people who practice uh, prostitution. So it's, it's excessively open to corruption in particular, and the risks for women remain if the regulation or the regulatory scheme either isn't followed or applied in a way that's detrimental to the women uh, concerned. So I've set out the social science data. I've explained very briefly the legal models in place that I'm looking at. Now I'd like to look at the way the law and the empirical data converge. So um, when you think about law's narrative, right, there's a particular uh, story that emerges or, or a thrust to the way in which law has developed in the three countries that I'm looking at. And the, the themes that animate law and policy, I'd say, are twofold. So the first is this imagery of who the prostitute is. And this is both historical and current. So she is viewed as both the vulnerable victim and as a wayward offender. So there's this binary imagery. So on, on one hand, she's a victim. And on the other hand, she's, she's offending. And she's uh, morally reprehensible. On either side of the coin, uh, the possibility for imagining her as resisting or crafting appropriate and clever responses to oppression and subordination is limited. So either she's crushed by oppression or she's irresponsible and morally depraved. These perceptions then twist law's response to the prostitute. It moves forward on the premise of protection or rehabilitation, but in neither case are the women at the core of the analysis viewed as living their lives or making their decisions in ways that challenge the dominant legal narrative. So that's one animating theme, this binary image of, um, of who these women are. And the second point that seems to be driving law, and here I, I've, I've discerned these animating themes by a read through many legislative debates, going through um, all of the state debates in Australia, as well as all of those in the federal uh, parliament of Canada and in, in um, the House of, of Lords in the United Kingdom. Um, so the first then being the, the binary imagery of the prostitute, and then the second being the sense of hierarchy among different forms of prostitution. So law communicates it through its um, policy and through legal rules a clear preference for indoor prostitution. Outdoor sex work is subject to scathing analysis and discourse. It is viewed as grotesque, crass, and indecent, and law's preference is to leave to the imagination what happens with private prostitution. And outdoor prostitution is the form of sex work that is the most um, subject to regulation, or rather to, to onerous regulation. Indoor sex work is the type of sex work that has been decriminalized or licensed. And where it remains criminalized in Canada, um, taking that as an example, where it remains criminalized, it is subject to deep constitutional scrutiny. The end result of this approach to draw this division between what is indoor and what is outdoor, or what is private and what is public, is to heighten deeply the vulnerability of women who work outdoors. So thinking about then the way law encounters um, uh, the empirical method, so identified law's um, narrative, and then contrasting that with the empirical analysis, um, I just want to say briefly, just in my reliance on empirical research was one of the, the main pro, um, features of, of this book and it was one of the main drivers underlying the project. So my project then uh, accepts that empirical methods that privilege the authority of experience can have some inherent flaws. And in one of the chapters, the first sort of foundational chapter of the book, I discuss what some of these challenges and flaws are, particularly when we're trying to study what we might call a hidden population or a vulnerable or criminalized population. But I also accept that empirics matter because they bring to light the dynamics that law ignores or presumes uh, absent. And empirics also illuminate law's unintended or adverse effects on the individuals and groups it sets out to protect, ironically heightening pre-existent vulnerability and disadvantage. Particularly with respect to prostitution, empirical research challenges the imagery of the victimized, desperate, and addicted woman. The narratives reflect heterogeneous narratives and experiences and show that although economic motivations might be present, they don't always emanate from extreme poverty and choice might be present, albeit subject to constraint, premised on a weighing of multiple options. 
Similarly, empirical data shows that the correlation between substance misuse and prostitution requires further investigation. Moreover, Law's stance on outdoor prostitution work is deeply at odds with the experience of many women. So Law views outdoor prostitution as being subject to um, or meriting deep scorn and disdain. So it attempts then to push to the periphery or boundaries of sp specific neighborhoods, right, the practice of prostitution. And in so doing, it renders vulnerable the women who then get hidden or pushed out of sight, right, because they're located or carry out their work in spaces that are removed from public scrutiny and therefore highly dangerous. However, some women actually prefer outdoor street work. They may not necessarily have the most ideal um, range of options at their disposal, but for some women, outdoor work is preferable because it's independent. So they're not subject to the disciplinary structures or uh, the rules that may be highly onerous within indoor sex work settings, notably brothels. There's also a contradiction in thinking about Law's efforts to push to the boundaries or beyond the boundaries uh, of a community or a neighborhood. These language, this language is used very much in the, the law and policy uh, debates. Um, to push outside these boundaries prostitu prostitution. So the idea then is that women are not part of the community when they practice prostitution. Instead, they're pushed out. The women and their practice are removed from the neighborhood which is, aims to be sanitized of them and of the practices and work that they're carrying out. What that narrative does, that's being propelled by the law and by legislative debate, it, this creates an image or an idea, which is actually false, that the women themselves are not part of the community from which they're being removed. Many women who are being pushed to the periphery in their outdoor, um, to carry out their outdoor trade, actually live in those communities. Or if they don't, they work in those communities. And by that fact, they are members of the community. So the sense of belonging and otherness that the law um, uh, creates and crafts through its discussion suggests an image which actually bears no, uh, does not play out in, in the um, narratives of the women themselves. And then last, when we think about the, the way that um, the legal discussions and the social science data compare, um, there is a, a strong um, uh, inconsistency that comes to light with respect to the ability of women engaged in prostitution to identify and manage risk. And this is where I, th I think we see the victim narrative that law um, th moves forward as being most severely challenged by social science evidence. So Law's responses to prostitution fail to account for and do not facilitate at all women's efforts to negotiate prostitution stark risks. So regarding physical risks, emotional risks, and the resultant choices about the work they do, women can muster considerable control over their situations even when these circumstances seem quite dire from the outside. And Law actually makes their ability to do that much more limited. So law then has some ongoing effects. Even though there is some inconsistency between um, the legal rules that have been created by the state and the informal normative factors that are driving women's decisions about whether to practice prostitution and if so, how, there are some inconsistencies there, but law has an ongoing presence and effect in the lives of these women, only that presence and the effects that it, have, it has are not at all what um, the law claims to be intending to do. Notably, uh, law's effects are as follows. So first, women are forced to practice prostitution in hidden private zones which amplify the risks to which they are subject, even though the point, according to legislative debate of prostitution law, is to protect these women. Second, criminalizing um, activity intensifies the stigma that's associated with it, and there are deep emotional consequences emotional health consequences of this for the women who engage in the work. Notably, many women will not disclose their involvement in prostitution even to their spouses or other family members because of its criminalized status. And maintaining this secret lifestyle is extremely stressful and toxic to their emotional well-being. It can often be identified by women as more hazardous to their health than the physical risks and the violence to which they perceive themselves as uh, susceptible to 
Criminalization also limits or even precludes access, of course, to necessary resources that would prevent or redress harms, such as access to hospitals, social assistance, women's shelter, and most importantly, the police. The rate of women who would actually report being violated or victimized or assaulted by someone with whom they work, a pimp, a John, or a police officer himself, the rate of the willingness to report is very low. So it's very hard to discern what the rate is, but the reports indicate anywhere from 11 to 19 percent. And then last, criminalization also precludes the possibility for equitable regulation of the work that these women are doing. Um, the result of that is some appalling conditions for many prostitutes which are set by those who own or manage sex work establishments. So very often um, the, the violation, if you will, occurs within uh, or by not necessarily uh, a client, right, but by the, the women and men for whom the prostitute works. And in one interview, one woman discussed some of the circumstances to which she was subject, um, which were I would call enslaving, and when the interviewer asked her, you know, why she didn't do anything about it, and her re reply was, well, what am I supposed to do? Go to the labor board, because of course that's just not a possibility, being completely unrecognized work, and in fact, opening the claim subjects her to, uh, to the potential of, um, of criminal charges and prosecution. So to sum up then, the, the point of my project is not to argue that we should envisage women in compromising or difficult circumstances as the classical liberal free agent who's responsible for her own circumstances and not needing or deserving of state attention and accommodation. Instead, my goal is to recognize that even when they operate within constraints, women are capable of staggering resistance and resourcefulness in coming to terms with and overcoming forces of oppression. I argue that criminal law is particularly ill-suited to identifying and addressing women's vulnerabilities. Instead, it ex exacerbates them. My claim is that drawing on empiricism opens possibilities for crafting legal approaches that respond more effectively and equitably to women's conditions. Moreover, cautious integration of notions of power, authority, and resistance, which build on empirical evidence, can complicate the current legal narrative of subjects like prostitution, which is premised on presumptions about women's victimization and domination. So my approach is indeed cautious, so as to ensure that it doesn't become a platform for justifying the state's neglect or dismissal of the real ongoing presence of vulnerability and risk in the lives of the women I consider in my book. As such, laws continued attention to the circumstances of women in prostitution, as in polygamy or paid surrogacy, is justified, but must be redirected from its current punitive stance to an approach that accounts appropriately for the lived experiences, needs, and strength of these women. Thanks. Yes, I know. Please know that it has nothing to do with your answer. <laughs> um, I had um, really two questions. Sure. Um, the first is that um, I do a lot of work, as I mentioned to you before the presentation, in the area of uh, the prostitution of children. Mm -hmm. And there is, a, there is a, a figure that's thrown around a lot. And I'll be honest that I have not looked at the underlying study from which it is drawn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how that entry in as a child, if that is, is, is accurate in mm -hmm. the community setting, um, how that impacts our idea of volition. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there's an element of socialization in the mm -hmm. role that I think has to be accounted for if that's true. Right. I don't know if that's come up at all in your empirical research in terms of when, when the activity began. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm okay. certainly not one who argues that children don't have volition. Right. Right? So, uh, uh, but I think that it's an element that needs to be sort of reconciled mm -hmm. um, okay. if there's any truth to it. Mm -hmm. um, the second question I had is, I guess it's more of a comment, but I'd love your reaction. Mm -hmm. um, I was struggling a little bit with separating out what you consider to be the drivers from what you consider to be the value. Uh -huh. um, and in particular, Separating the economic driver from the value of flexibility, mm -hmm. I don't think 
evaluate your economic options without what it means for the rest of your life, particularly if you have dependents. Right. Right. So if I have other economic options, i.e. a job that doesn't give me time to take care of my children, is that really an option? Mm -hmm. it, is that an option I can actually evaluate and accept? And, and can we really evaluate those things separately if I have these dependent responsibilities that are important? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll take them in turn. So on the issue of, of children and the age of entry into, the, into prostitution, um, I haven't seen that figure quoted, although I have seen ample research to suggest that the number of, of uh, women who began engaging in prostitution-related activities is very young, right? So not usually less than 16, um, but I don't have a firm figure. Um, what I have seen is evidence on the correlation between a history of childhood trauma, notably childhood um, sexual assault and sexual abuse, um, and a, a higher kind of disproportionate representation of kids who have been sexually abused involved in prostitution at a later age. Now, the, there is controversial evidence on that point, right? So again, it's not necessarily clear that the disproportionate presence is necessarily a causal factor. And, and it could just be that a lot of the people who, who end up working in prostitution had very turbulent households during their youth, and that's how the, the change occurred. But it's just very difficult. And even the people who've done a lot of the kind of very um, intense uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis on the topic are reluctant to draw firm conclusions about correlations between uh, episodes of abuse during childhood and then outcomes related to a presence in prostitution in adulthood or young adulthood. Um, uh, so, it, but it goes to, like, I think, irrespective of that, uh, what matters is that we're thinking about volition, right? And that, that's the point, I think, that's at the heart of your question, which is, if people become involved in prostitution so young, um, then how do we identify or claim anything about choice? And I've had that come up also with polygamy, because in the community that I studied, many of the women who were involved in plural marriages got married very young. And the only way to assess that, and I had tried during that research to interview women who were under the age, or girls under the age of, uh, who, were, who were not adults, basically, under the age of 19 in British Columbia. And I wasn't allowed to for ethics reasons. My ethics board wouldn't allow me. But the point is that um, I could only trust what adults told me now about the volition then, right? Or about what they tell me about the, the choices they would help their own daughters make. And my sense is that if you're making a decision either to become a polygamous bride or to work on the streets in the sex trade at the age of 14, I question severely volition. And I think the circumstances are such that your options are so limited that we can, you know, we might find resistance, we might find resilience, we might find strength, and I wouldn't want to take away any of those attributes. But volition is something quite different to me. And I haven't worked that out in the chapter because I've left aside the issue of children, but I think you're right to point out that many of these people who are being interviewed, even though they're of the age of majority now, weren't always when they were engaged in prostitution. So that's very fair. Um, I don't know if that addresses sufficiently the first question. On the second, on the meaning and value, that's something that I get literally every time I present this work, and I makes me wonder whether there, there is enough of a distinction to actually tease them out or try to do so in the text. And the only way that um, I, I kind of justify this is to go back to my first questions. And, and the whole book, in chapter one of the book, I explain the difference between meaning and value at length well, not super length, but some length. And I, and I tried to explain why, to me, the two questions are distinct. And for me, it's important to think about prior to entry into a particular practice or before making a decision that a woman knows or that anyone knows is going to be looked upon with some kind of question or um, scrutiny or scorn by the kind of mainstream outside world, what are the factors that were being tabulated before making that choice. So what, and what, and once you're involved in that lifestyle, what reasons do you give for being there, for, for continuing with a particular practice? And I see that as different from the way in which a woman evaluates it as being positive or negative. Now, the issue of money 
And even as I was thinking about this, preparing for this talk today, last night, I was thinking the flexibility thing um, uh, matters very much to both the meaning and the value, right? Because a woman may say, I hope to get out of this a lifestyle that will allow me to care for my sick mother, take care of my kids, and make enough money to pay the rent and the electricity and everything. And when asked a year into her, her life, um, after taking up prostitution, why is it valued or not, she'll say, well, it's a tough life and there's a lot of stress, right? Stress is a huge factor, much more than, well, stress is linked to the exposure to violence, but it's very stressful. But at the same time, I make my own hours, I'm in control of my work situation, I service the clients that I want to service, I work where I want to work, and I'm my own boss. So I think it, it overlaps, for sure. Okay. Thank okay, thank you for your question. Claudia? Claudia? Mm -hmm. and more susceptible to other vulnerabilities mm -hmm. um, and how this influence regulation because then maybe you're going to have more problems with um, access to um, yes. health care or police um, yeah so I don't have firm numbers on on the demographic makeup but um, this came up also in conversation with Stu earlier this morning um, re related to more to the issue of um, racial identity. And in Canada, um, Aboriginal women are grossly uh, disproportionately represented in prostitution. Um, there are also um, a high number of migrant women who are represented in certain urban areas, uh, also in Australia. So, but I don't have particular numbers on the percentages. Um, I do know that this affects the response that women have to um, uh, violence in, in prostitution. So if a woman has difficulty, let's say, expressing herself with language, or if a woman knows that her community has been consistently ignored by the police, then that will give rise to reticence, deeper resident, re, uh, reticence than already would exist to report the offense. And that has been definitely true in the case of Aboriginal women. And also it affects um, the, the rate of reporting for women who are immigrant women as well. It also affects um, where women work. So very often women who um, share the same language or culture will work together, right? And offer each other uh, support or services um, that w they wouldn't otherwise have. But in terms of the actual numbers, I, I unfortunately don't have those. Okay, yes. The other issue was uh, do with um, the value. Mm -hmm. uh, you were mentioning that uh, women who have the oppressive flesh show that they were they have the flexibility even in their in their work. And I was wondering whether it you know it came to your attention because in that study, uh, the Ugandan study, uh, the patients actually mentioned that uh, they felt more empowered. I'll take the second question first, if that's okay. So I didn't find that primarily because I think that the discussions surrounding the institution of marriage 
is somewhat different. I'm not all, uh, not exponentially so, but in the West there is the sense, and it's we can deconstruct, deconstruct this till next week of at least formal equality in marriage. Um, so n no, that didn't come up in the sense that there's a preference to being a wife who isn't paid for her sexual services. But what did come up, what, and this is linked to the idea of um, intrigue and curiosity as a motivator, um, is a sense that there's a satisfaction in allowing clients to explore their own sexual selves, that women see themselves as conducive to reaching that goal for many clients. And I don't think any of them called that empowering, but I think many saw that as assuming control over the relationship. That actually the vulnerable party in the union between the prostitute and the client wasn't the prostitute. That actually the, the, the client was at her mercy in the sense that she was in control of allowing him to reach his sexual dream or desire. And so that came up quite a bit. The other thing that comes up is, is in terms of um, control and empowerment relates to the stance that women adopt in prostitution very often, and especially experienced women. Um, the stance that's adopted is one of being in control. And that is viewed as a way to um, reduce the possibility or the exposure to violence. And so being um, holding oneself out as being in control and owning the encounter is a way to feel both empowered but also to ensure that things go as planned, that you will get paid what you agreed to be paid, right? Because that's often where the violence occurs, is that there's a misunderstanding about what the terms of agreement are in the exchange and the money that's supposed to be paid isn't paid or the, the uh, worker asks for too much in the eyes of the client for the services rendered and things escalate from there. And that's linked to a critique of the solicitation ban because if you, can't, if you can't communicate for the purposes of prostitution, the transaction happens in haste and therefore the terms of agreement can't be worked out in a kind of clear-minded, open way. So the, the, there's a rush to secrecy and to the private zone where the sex happens and then it, when it's done, um, the payment isn't what's expected or the services are not what's expected because there was no discussion in advance. And um, the, the argument is that a, a, the permissibility to communicate for prostitution would reduce the risk of that happening because the terms of agreement could be laid out even in writing if need be, like any other contract for services. Um, Okay, so now I've gotten, I've, I took your silly, uh, took your questions in reverse order. Remind me of the first one again, if you can. Oh, the Ugandan. Yeah, so, okay, so on that, um, the, there's much discussion on, on the, the work site as linked to rate of risk. And it is definitely the case that working out of a, a setting that's familiar is viewed as reducing risk. And that's linked to the idea of flexibility and control. So, so the ability to determine for oneself where the work happens is critical to feeling that one's in control of the circumstances and to feeling that the, there's an ability to mitigate or reduce risk. And the kind of rule of thumb that comes up often in the literature that circulates um, on or about uh, sex work or prostitution is that you do not let clients take you to unknown places. Um, so, you, But the problem with um, the body house or brothel provisions is that any place, it doesn't have to be a kind of place that's labeled body house or prostitution outside, right? Any place that's habitually used for prostitution counts as a body house or a brothel. So if woman's house is used more than once, even, more, even twice, then it falls under the legal definition of a brothel and she's therefore engaging in a criminal activity. So her ability to, to create or identify safe spaces and use those is severely circumscribed by the way the law operates. Sue? Mm -hmm. Use of the term prostitute because mm -hmm. it seems to have been a 
guess I'm not sure what you gain by using fossil fuel versus erotic labor or, mm -hmm. or, or sex work more generally. Um, is, this, is, is this something in particular around the exchange of, 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 of sex for money that you think is more denigrative or mm -hmm. there's more stigmatizing that you're trying to draw out? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that you speak about passion broadly, mm -hmm. maybe pornography or erotic dancing and, and porn sex. Mm -hmm. But if you keep concerned with both the, the, the moral sensibility and the finality, uh, that, 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 that's yeah. kind of more broadly. So, yeah. um, and then just, just hearing the term fossil fuel over and over again, even though I know you're trying to demean it, it's just joking. I know, it's jarring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, that when you, when you take this sex away from the work, then you lose this whole labor analysis yeah. and this ability to talk complexly about, I think... Or the work away from the sex. Well, right? Yeah. It, it, it is, yeah. Because labor is so at the heart of the concern. Like every yeah. Every vacation, working vacations, and vacations, and between meals, and mm -hmm. meals, you know, it's, it's so evident that that's really at the heart of what we need to do here. Yeah. So I feel like taking, taking the term fossil fuel to the foreground instead of sex work, which already has all these nuances of what's fine mm -hmm. and what's mm -hmm. not right, um, mm -hmm. just Okay, so that's really helpful. Um, and so as I mentioned at the beginning, and we talked about this, that I really wrestled with lexicon, right? So I don't, I'm not at all happy about the word, um, but I wanted to use it because, well, first of all, I wanted to funnel so that to focus on both the historical and current regulation of the exchange of sex for money. But then, again, that can include all of the other things we've mentioned. Um, but there are distinct concerns that arise in the literature um, on the experiences of women who don't engage in prostitution as traditionally understood, but who are involved in pornography, let's say. And I felt that if I use sex, word, sex work writ large, that I would then feel that there was a problem with failing to address the particular experiences of women who didn't Involve, get involved in working in a brothel or body house or on the street as sex workers, but um, were involved, let's say, in uh, phone sex or erotic dance. And I, I worried about that then becoming a weakness. So I'm not sure. There may be a trade-off or there may be a way to say, I'm focusing, I'm using the term sex work, but I'm focusing here on this particular practice because, not that these other forms, the, the, these other uh, practices might raise the identical concerns and the the analysis might be very comparable but when i reviewed the literature there are distinct concerns to women who are engaged in the pornography industry for sure and i couldn't i would do a disservice to that by just ignoring it and sweeping it under the rug because there are distinctions but i think it may work and i think in the chapter there's even a footnote that says there are distinct um, experiences and concerns with respect to these these particular practices and then i cite to some stuff um, it may work, therefore, to say I'm using the terminology of sex work, but focusing on this particular practice. It's, it's erotic labor. That's what you're really trying to get at. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
To me, that's entirely consistent with what's going on in the three countries that's, that I'm looking at. And the reason it's consistent is that it's, again, privileging this very hidden form of sex work. And, and it also um, is linked very much to class, right? Escorting is a higher, uh, there's a higher income bracket that goes hand in hand with escort services than um, is pertinent to on the street sex work. And so there's a sense that it's a kind of like a business class version of prostitution. And it's viewed as being okay because it happens usually in fancy hotels and it's accompanied by you know, very nice lingerie and gifts and food. And it's viewed as being kind of amenable to a particular lifestyle, right? And, and whereas kind of on the street work is, is so crass and indecent um, that we, we, the reaction to it is much more visceral, right? Whereas escort, escorting is viewed as being more tolerable. So I, th I think it's very much not only consistent with the private and public, but also with the class dynamics associated with the way that the law regulates prostitution, sex work, erotic labor, writ large. And um, there's a, something really not so seedy about escort work that uh, exists when we're, we're talking about the reaction to outdoor work. Thank you.